Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Sabit. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about tales from the reef because, yes, the corals, they can tell us the stories. We just need to learn how to listen or how to write these stories. Um, how environmental um, changes affect corals and how we coral scientists study these corals and learn how to read them. But before we go ahead um, and talk about corals, I would like to talk to you about the complaint tablet uh, to Ia Nasir. This tablet is currently held in the British Museum in London. It's probably one of my favorite items in the museum because it's the oldest known written complaint. And I just find it something very human. We Everybody likes to complain, right? Um, so this complaint was written to Ian Asir, who was a copper dealer. And the person who bought the dealer was complaining about um, how bad the copper was. It was not good quality and how rude he had been to the servant who had trouble to pick up this copper. So this belongs to Babylonian, it's Mesopotamian uh, civilization and it's written in Akkadian cuneiform. So this language was lost. We could not understand it at all until we discovered the Behistun inscription, which is in Iran. So the Behistun inscription is the equivalent to the Rosetta Stone in and the ancient Egypt hieroglyphs, which is probably more um, famous. Uh, basically, it's the same text written in three different script languages. As long as we are able to understand one of that language, then we can translate any other language, any of or the other two languages that appear in this inscription. And that's how we were able to uh, translate the complaint tablet to ANSRs and many other archives, archaeological and historian archives. And that's how we can understand how ancient civilization worked, what was their culture, what was their life like. Um, so it is it's, it's a very simple concept, but I would like you to keep this in mind. If we have a piece of information in an unknown, unknown language, and the same information is in a known language, that exactly there we have the key to translation. We can calibrate this information and we can then move forward onto any other archive and just translate it into something we can understand. Um, so yes, keep that in, in mind. And with this in mind, now we're moving into corals. Because corals, um, they can be seen as archives of complaints as well. So corals respond to their surrounding environment. Whenever the conditions in their surrounding environment are not good enough, then they are gonna respond in one way or another. So we need to understand how coral reefs respond to specific events, uh, how these events uh, happen through time, what's the frequency, what's the intensity, and how corals react to this. And this coral reaction, that's gonna be recorded in this coral. So effectively, we're gonna have an archive of complaints, which is what we use. But um, first things first, what is a coral? Because uh, for me, as a coral scientist, it is pretty obvious, but for some people it might not be. In fact, corals, when they were first described, they were described as plants, which is not surprising because when you see them, uh, under the water, they are anchored to the seafloor and they, they are just there. They look like plants, they look like flowers. So it is very easy to know why, why they might have been described as, as plants. But actually, currently corals are described as animals, but they are actually an animal, but they are also, act, uh, also part plant and part rock. So essentially they are colonial animals or individual, but they are formed by polyps, which is every single of these tiny flowers, I guess, uh, that we can see in this picture. So polyps are the uh, building unit of each coral. So they are formed by different tentacles that can move and trap uh, microorganisms and nutrients and then direct this uh, capture into the mouth that they have in the middle of these tentacles. But we also said they are part plant. Where is this plant coming from? So inside each one of these polyps, there are microscopic algae that we call zooxanthellae. These algae live inside the polyps and they produce food 
with sunlight. This is the photosynthesis, just like plants. They use inorganic nutrients and sunlight to produce organic nutrients. So they feed the corals, uh, and in exchange, the coral protect this algae. And on top of that, they can also, well, they also are part rock, right? Because corals, some of the corals at least, um, they build a skeleton that support uh, all the polyps. So this skeleton is made of calcium carbonate. That's a mineral, can be calcite or aragonite, which is essentially what constitute limestone. So they deposit a tiny or very, very thin layer on a daily basis, slowly growing, um, which is, is, is very, very slow. So we could not appreciate that, but because they can live up to hundreds of years, 500, 600 years, the amount of a skeleton that they deposit and that we can find, it, it's enormous. So just, just to reflect a little bit on this, because I find mind blowing that tiny polyps that are barely a couple of millimeters big or long in diameter, they form massive structures that we know as reef that can be several kilometers long. These structures are so big that we can see them from space. And, and this, to me, it's, it is mind blowing. So they are, they are very tough animals. They've been around for millions of years. They survived the extinction that killed the dinosaurs and they are still happily living out there. They grow for a very long time and, and it, is, it is fascinating. So as they grow this, as they grow this skeleton, as they deposit this uh, mineral skeleton, as this rocky skeleton, uh, they, they keep growing upwards and sidewards and that's how they build the reefs. Different coral species grow in different shapes. We have plates that like this one, we can see some grow like branching, like trees, some are like roses, some just grow like massive boulders. They, they can be a few meters in diameter. Um, so all these uh, different species, all this complexity creates a three dimensionality in the reefs. And these different spaces, different levels within the reef is what um, benefits other species to, to host to, or, or to be around in the reefs. Um, so it is just, just to compare them because sometimes reefs can be like something that we can only see in pictures, but it's just like a forest. In a forest, you can see many different types of trees, many different types of bushes, many different types of plants that grow on top of other plants. They compete against each other for light, they compete for food. And um, in this um, complex ecosystem, there is other animals. There is animals that live under the soil that feed on uh, decaying leaves. There is animals that live in the wood. There is animals that feed on other animals. So reefs are essentially like rainforests, but within the sea. Um, they occupy only 0.2% of the ocean floor but support more than 25% of all the marine species. This means that one in four marine species in the entire ocean depends on the reef for their survival or they uh, inhabit the reefs at some point in their lives, um, which is, it is very important. So yeah, fascinating structures and ecosystems. But if we look beyond the biodiversity importance of coral reefs, they are also very valuable for us as uh, humanity, especially for coastal communities, for food security, for source and livelihood. It is calculated that around half a billion of people in the entire world uh, live um, on a, I don't know, maybe some hundred kilometers distance from the reefs, more or less and they depend directly on the services from the reef. In many cases, the only source of protein that these people have uh, comes from fish that thrives thanks to the coral reef. So it is extremely important, not only for security, but also to tourism. A lot of people travel around the world to scuba dive, snorkel, and experience the coral reefs. And this is an important source of income and employment for these coastal communities. Um, coastal protection. It's probably one of the most important services of the reefs and one of the least discussed. 
uh, because reefs form such a big and complex structures, they are able to absorb wave energy. Um, so in case of cyclones, hurricanes, and rising sea levels, the amount of coastal, uh, um, the coast area that is going to be deteriorated is going to be minimized thanks to healthier reefs. This is especially important in the framework of climate change because uh, it's predicted that tropical storms are going to increase not only in intensity but also in frequency. So we need healthy reefs to protect um, these areas. It's very important also for these coastal communities, the reefs as a culture, it, it is part of their identity, is who they are. Um, so from a humane point of view and a sociological point of view, they, they are very important as well. And of course, uh, they are also widely used for biomedical research. Uh, at the moment, there is a lot of uh, scientists looking for different drugs and medicines that come from the reefs, the coral in itself, or from the organisms that live in the reefs. Um, so yeah, the value, it's, it's enormous, especially, and I keep saying this, but it's especially important for coastal communities, especially in uh, small state islands, uh, like in the Southwest Pacific and the Caribbean. These are the small developing countries that are mostly uh, coastal, and the, everything about them it strongly depends on these reefs. So we, we need to protect them. We need to make sure they thrive into the future, regardless of whatever happens with climate change. So yes, uh, we were talking, the value of the coral reefs, it's very important, but impacts, environmental impacts on these reefs is gonna reduce these uh, services that they are providing. Um, so to improve the management or to minimize the impact, we need to know what type of stressors are acting on these coral reefs. So one way of looking at them is dividing them whether it's global acting or local. So the global impacts, they uh, mostly derive from climate change and they are seawater warming, ocean acidification, sea level rise, um, tropical storms and cyclones, as we said before. This is going on on a global scale. It's, it's not a focused impact. It, it happens to many, many different reefs uh, across oceans at the same time. And then local impacts are those that are, um, are just happening on a specific reef at a point of time, like can be overfishing or land-based pollution, which is uh, basically whatever happens inland ends up affecting the reefs. Uh, for example, if you have a big watershed that is suffering for high, from high deforestation, um, then that's going to increase river runoff, and then the river is going to end up going to the reef and it's gonna increase sediment suspension in the reef that can smooth the corals. Um, so different impacts require different uh, management and conservation um, strategies. And small, again, small state countries, they have a very little power politically and economical to modify these global impacts, right? Um, they keep saying that they are drowning, that they are struggling, but and they are really, they are not contributing to climate change. And yet they are the mostly affected. So they try to manage the local impacts the way they can. It isn't clear at this point how these global impacts and local impacts interact, whether a poor water quality caused by land-based pollution is going to make corals less resistant to marine heat waves, or it's not affecting at all, still an ongoing debate. Um, and it is, again, it is very important. So we need to understand how corals respond to these impacts, whether there is any synergies between these impacts at all, and this is going to improve reef management, conservation policies, and improve the life quality of the, the people who depend on, on these coral reefs. And that's what we, uh, coral scientists, have an important role to play. So how do we study corals? Well, it depends. So one way of looking at this, uh, it's from coral records. We look at past events, like storms of marine heat waves, and how corals responded, what was the frequency and the intensity of these events, and how long it took for corals to recover after these events. Um, so that's focusing on the past. 
uh, there is also reef survey, reef monitoring, which focused on the current state of the reefs, what changes are going on right now, and how corals are evolving due to these changes. Or we can look into the future. We can get data from the past, data from the future, and just throw this into reef modeling and understanding how, depending what the projections of climate change are going to be, the reefs will behave in one way or, or another. So yeah, but th there, is, there is a continuum. It's not such a thing as completely different spaces because the current state of the reefs, it's obviously impacted by whatever happened in the past. So you need to study the past at the same time you're studying uh, or monitoring the reefs to get the full picture of what's going on in that specific reef and how that will behave in the future. Um, so it is a complex science and it is a wide science. So what I'm going to be talking about is what I do. I focused on coral records. I look at coral archives and I look at what happened in the past and how coral reacted. How do we do this? How is it, how is it even possible to kind of travel in time and see what was the environment whenever, I don't know, 100 years ago, for example? Well, that's thank you to this type of corals. And they are very appropriately, I would say, known as massive corals or boulder corals because they grow massive, um, very scientific term here. And not only they grow massive, they grow for hundreds of years and they grow in bands. So they, they are, it's pretty much used like tree rings. You can count bands, you can analyze whatever was going on in a specific year, and you can know what was the environment doing at that precise point of time. So to recover this, we look at two different um, records from, this, from these corals. We look at physical records and geochemical. The physical records, this is just growth. How was the coral growing? We have here are our polyps that we were saying before is the building unit of all the corals. So every tiny thing here is just a polyp. In this species, polyps are barely one millimeter big. So it's thousands of polyps. So they grow and when they grow upwards, they just lay a new layer of very thin skeleton. And the properties of this layer is going to depend on the temperature or the conditions in the water. So you can measure how much a coral grew on a specific year and how thick that skeleton was. And that's going to tell us some information about the environment. And not only that, then with that information in hand, we can measure the chemical composition of that skeleton. Uh, we can measure things like trace elements, like barium, or lithium, strontium. And um, so the chemical composition of the skeleton is going to depend on environmental conditions. So if the salinity changes, that's going to affect uh, the concentration of barium, for example, in the skeleton. If the temperature changes, that's going to affect how much strontium is being incorporated into the skeleton. If the pH change, that's going to change how the boron uh, or how much boron is being incorporated. So really, really with these two type of proxies, with these two type of records, we can get a very, very detailed image of what was the environment at a certain point of time. And because as we said, they grow for hundreds of years, we were, able, we were able to go back in time hundreds of years to specifically what was the environment doing. And this is extremely cool, if you ask me. I'm probably biased because this is what I do, but it is fascinating. Knowing this is how corals grow, knowing this is the theory of what we do, how, how is it done logistically, right? Because these are pretty big corals. How do, how do we do to get that into the lab and analyze the physical records and the geochemistry of, of these samples. Well, we uh, collect what we call coral reefs rather than taking the whole colony, which would be impractical and also would be a physical damage to the reef, which is what we want to avoid at all costs. We just core um, a tiny cylinder of material from the top of a colony. This is just like a biops. So you get, it's just a witness of that amount of time of 
which the coral has been alive. And then this colony can grow over the tiny hole that is created and it just continues living as happily. So with this core is what we take home, we cut it open and we expose the inside material. So for example, here you can see that this is the top of the course and there's clearly some bands already in there. Um, so you can easily count and think in this one, for example, there is clearly a band over there. So something must have happened that make that coral to struggle there a little bit. And this is how we start puzzling things together. So once we have this exposed material, X-rays become uh, very, very useful. Um, this banding that we are seeing that they are like three rings, it's actually changes in density. Uh, these changes in density are caused by changes in temperature. So we have during the summer, higher temperatures, the coral skeleton grows uh, more dense, so thicker. And that's being, that's reflected in the X-rays as a darker color. Uh, during the winter, low density, colder temperature is reflected as a clearer color. And here, you, you would just have to count bands and then you would go back. So in this one, for example, we know that the top was 2004, to, yeah, 2004 and just counting bands, we get to the uh, early 70s. With this uh, rough idea of how old a coral is, now we're going to go into... Um, the meat, the meat of it. Um, so I was talking at the beginning about calibration. So we're getting a piece of information that we know, a piece of information that we don't know, and just create our key to translate. So this is this is it, right? We have here a different type of coral. It was collected in 2017, and you can count bands. Um, they are very thin, so this type of coral grows barely two, three millimeters per year. But it is very obvious a high density band happening there in the year 2000. Uh, it is very obvious. This is the same coral, different perspective, 1993 and 2000. The coral, for whatever is going on, the coral is responding by laying a very, very thicker, very, very thick, uh, thicker wall around each one of the polyps that is not happening in previous years. So we need to know what is causing this coral to react in this way. In this case, we have a seawater temperature collected through satellites or so remote sensing from the same reef uh, that this sample was collected. And if we look at the year 2000, uh, we see that it was unusually warm in comparison to the previous years. Um, it, it, as it happens, the year 2000 in Fiji, where this coral was collected, suffered the first massive bleating in the entire country. So things start to add up. Um, the year was very warm. There was massive bleating in the entire country. We can clearly see that the coral there is struggling. The opposite can be seen in 2010. We have some areas there with lower density and those years were colder so that the coral is reacting in a different way. This here is our calibration. This is where we can see something that we understand. This is satellite temperature. Something that we don't understand is the coral telling us something, but we don't know what. And when we put it together, we can say, oh, okay. So when it, when it gets hot, the, the density increases. When it gets cold, the density decreases. With, not, with that knowledge in hand, now we can go back in time as deep as our sample is and see when it's been warmer periods of time or colder periods of time. And this is key, this is the calibration. And it, it, it is fundamental to reconstruct any past environment. We need to know how or what is causing that coral to react in one way or another. That was physical proxies. Geochemical proxies is the other type of record that I was talking about. Um, so here, what we can see is, again, is an X-ray of one of the samples, and we measure uh, the geochemical composition across the red track. So we can just create a very detailed time series of all the composition across time. Pretty cool. And then we overlap this with environmental data that we know it's, it's real, it's true. We have rainfall, seawater turbidity, and wind speed. 
Um, with this, again, we just create a calibration. And one thing that we can see that is pretty obvious is how yttrium and manganese react to rainfall. Whenever we have very heavy uh, rainfall events or very wet years, there is a curve um, that is presented in the chemical composition of the skeleton. It is very clear in 2007, 2008, uh, somewhat clear as well in 2012, 2014. So th that's it, that's our key to translation. Now we go back in time and whenever we see an elevation of these two elements, we're gonna be able to say with a good certainty that that period of time was wetter than, um, than the average. And that's how we are able to reconstruct events. With this information, now we feed into current state, we, we feed into uh, reef modeling and that's, that's how we do it. Basically, um, because reef monitoring started uh, in the 70s, is becoming more and more widespread. So we can get a good snapshots of the current state of the reefs and environmental data, remote sensing, satellite data. You can get some data from 1980s, but from 1980s, there is nothing. From 2000 onwards, there starts to be more and more data with better quality, better resolution, but any, anything further before 1980, we just need to rely on, on records, whether it's from corals or from other um, environmental archives. And because again, they live for so long, the records can go and go on for a, for a very long time. And that's how we are able to uh, travel through time. It's just opening a book onto what happened in the past. But to be able to read this book, that is the corals, we need to, we need a dictionary to translate what the coral is saying to our language that we can understand. And, and that's it. Just to summarize, we need to preserve the services from the reefs and we need to understand what are the ecological processes happening between the reefs. The past impacted the shape of reefs today. So whatever happened before, it's gonna, it's gonna affecting today. So we need to know what happened in the past. And for these corals are very good marine archives um, of environmental change. But we need to calibrate them, which is uh, one of the most important parts of our jobs as, as coral scientists. And that's everything. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anna, for this very interesting talk. It's great actually to have an opportunity to travel uh, through uh, well, different places uh, that look very nice. It's a bit like being on holiday. Uh, is there any question uh, for Anna? If so, it would be fantastic if uh, you could write them in the chat or otherwise please uh, ask to get unmuted and you can just talk to us through your microphone. Uh, we, we still have a few minutes, I guess, for maybe a couple of questions. I'm looking at the chat. No questions so far. Well, I, I think I have a, a very general question, um, but please people in, in the audience, if you want to ask questions, don't, don't be shy. Uh, we've never had actually a silly question so far. So I think it, any sort of question might be very interesting to us. Um, my personal question is, so you've talked a lot about the calibration of the technique. And uh, so in, in your research, have you had a chance then to apply your calibration to go back uh, in time? And uh, if so, have you found anything interesting that perhaps you were not uh, expecting from the, the record in uh, essentially the skeleton of corals? Um, that is a very good question. So I haven't been able to apply the calibration to go further down deeper time uh, with the records. It was it was planned, but then you know COVID happened and things got a bit crazy. But even by doing the calibration, I've seen things that um, I was not expecting. So for example, barium is widely used as a water quality as river runoff. Um, and in my side, so I focus all my research focused on Fiji. I find that barium might not be as reliable as in other areas as the Great Barrier Reef, for example. 
Um, so that was a bit unexpected, but it is very interesting because it clearly points towards we need to understand each reef as a separate entity. Whatever is going on in the Great Barrier Reef doesn't apply for all the reefs around the world. So um, yes, we need more research focus, like local focus or regional focus at the very least. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's been a bit frustrating, I guess, for many researchers, especially people doing field work in the past couple of years with COVID. Yeah, it's been complicated for so many people. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I mean, what you talked about is still very interesting. So hopefully in the future, we'll have an opportunity to, to apply this knowledge. Uh, there is a question uh, coming through the chat. Uh, so when you are doing your field work or sampling, how, how did the pigeons <laughs> people you met in the local communities react? Um, um, right, this is a very good question and it is very important. So I didn't collect the samples myself. Uh, my supervisor, Cynthia uh, Sosian and Eleanor John uh, with Jenny Malayo from Australia collected samples, but I, I've talked about this uh, with them a lot. Uh, interestingly enough, the reefs in Fiji belong to the coastal communities. It belongs to each village. So to be able to sample in these reefs, you need to ask permission to the chief and um, they are usually always very helpful and open to um, any kind of collaboration. So they, they are very welcoming people. But I think um, it is very important to keep in mind that the reefs belong to them and you need to be respectful and it is, and you need to give back to the community something. It's not a matter of just going there, getting your samples, going back, and then I forget about the country. It is, it is very important that connection with scientists and, and the society and give something back. Great, thanks. Uh, there, I think there is a, yeah, there is a, <laughs> there is a general comment. I don't know if you want to react on this. Uh, and probably, yes, uh, so someone is saying that, yeah, the evidence that you've presented uh, provides an excellent record of problems uh, facing reefs. And uh, that person is an amateur scuba diver, uh, like with 600, over actually 600 dives over 30 years. And he's been actually very shocked or impressed by changes in the, the reef uh, with, with, I guess, increasing leaching events. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of scary, actually. I, I guess well, my my take on this kind of comment is like it's it's kind of scary when uh, we see actually changes in our environment during the lifetime because we always assume that the nature or the natural environments have always been very very stable through time, and they certainly have been for for most of the time uh, before human beings. You know, have to get changes at a scale of million years or so, but. Uh, it's, it's really impressive, I guess, to see the difference in uh, in uh, in recent times. So, I guess perhaps a, a related question would be: uh, in in what we know about the, the record from coral reefs, uh, has it been actually an increase in bleaching events that you can actually also read uh, in your uh, in your calls in your measurements? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yes. So this is seeing not only in Fiji, it's, it's a trend that we can see in the reefs all over the world, um, which makes the science more robust. And this is how you want to go to the public and to the policymakers is, is saying this is happening and it's, it's, it's not coming from just one area, it's coming from many different fronts. Um, so the first uh, recorded massive blitzing was in uh, 1998 with, um, El Nino was one of the strongest El Nino recorded. And um, at the time, so then there was another one, but it seemed like the time in between bleaching events was around 10 years, which was enough time for the corals to recover for sure. So it was problematic, but it was okay. They can recover. But it's been seen that since 2014, 2015 onwards, the bleaching is almost annual, which is is it's appalling. It's, it's really, really bad. There was a very bad marine heat wave going on in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific for several years. And what we see is that the, the coral cover is, is decreasing beyond anything that can be repaired. They, they just don't have enough time to recover from, from these stressors. So yes, for sure, 
the, the frequency of bleaching events has been increasing, has been doubled, and corals are definitely struggling with this. Thanks a lot, Anna. And yeah, the second part of the comment was really about, I guess, when you're communicating with uh, the wider public and the politicians, the wider public, I guess, you're doing this today, uh, but I imagine your research has also some uh, connection to policymakers, as, as you just mentioned. Yes, definitely. It, it, has, it has a strong connection with um, management and uh, policymakers, for sure. It, it seems to be a bit tricky, really, especially at uh, global scale policies. Things keep changing, but is it fast enough? We, we don't know. It, it is a bit troublesome, um, especially because there is other interests at, at play, right? Um, so it, it is complex, but we try. We definitely try. Yeah, sounds sounds good. And yeah, you also <laughs> mentioned you work with local communities. So I think a lot of, of the research that we do in universities has some implications for uh, people wherever in the world. It could be in Wales, but uh, you just mentioned uh, that, you know, there was some work going on in Fiji. So yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Anna, for, for this quite interesting talk. I hope that you will have more success with your fieldwork in, in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, thank, thanks everyone for attending the webinar today. Uh, our next webinar is going to be in two weeks. So I'm going to be uh, presenting something on drilling submarine volcanoes. It's actually really new results, preliminary results coming from uh, an international expedition that took place in the South Atlantic. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you uh, in two weeks. And in the meantime, remember, uh, you can always find uh, the previous webinars recorded uh, on our YouTube channel. So thank you, uh, everyone, and uh, see you soon. Thank you.